We are so delighted to welcome you to another amazing professional growth webinar series presented by Lympha Press. I am Brenda Viola, proud to present this webinar to you today. And we see people logging on right now. So I'm going to do a little bit of preamble so we can get everybody who has signed up ready to go. The material we're going to cover is amazing. And the reason why we have an amazing speaker. You probably saw the name Dr. Emily Eicher and said, oh, I got to attend that one. Well, I said the same thing and it's an incredible honor to welcome her today. Dr. Eicher speaks nationally and internationally. She is based in Santa Monica, California and runs the Lymphedema Center. It's a center of excellence. She has personal insight into lymphedema. And today's presentation is going to be all about the conservative management of both lymphedema and lipedema. Lipedema is a very intriguing subject. We're still learning so much about it. And so that's why we're really excited to have Dr. Eicher here to speak on this. She's gonna be presenting some case studies. And we are particularly interested because as you know, Lympha Press offers the only device cleared by the FDA for the treatment of lipedema. The only one in the United States that's cleared by the FDA, it's the Optimal Plus. So we work closely with lipedema patients around the country and we love talking to medical professionals. We're all learning together so that we can bring help and hope to this patient population. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Emily Eicher. Thank you for your time today. We are all ears and we're on the edges of our seats too. Thank you, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great honor to share my work with you and with all of you listeners. And I, I have to do it in one hour. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me or call me because I can talk about this for hours and hours. So with that conservative management of lymphedema and lipedema, uh, this picture shows you a combination of lymphedema and lipedema. And even today, it is lymphedema, not so much, but lipedema. It is misdiagnosed, mistreated, and so on. So in disclosure, I have speaking engagement with lympha press. And we'll st I'll start with lymphedema first, then we'll continue with lipedema. Lymphedema, as you know, chronic progressive disorder if not treated, and it is a result of impaired lymphatic system function. The prime function of the lymphatic system is to maintain fluid balance by clearing the interstitial space of excess water, large molecules, lipids, antigens, immune cells, and particular matter. It was described by our are one and only Dr. Roxton. The International Society of Lymphology consensus in 2016 coined lymphedema as a low output failure. It is a mechanical insufficiency of the lymphovascular system where the lymphatic transport is reduced. Transport has fallen below the capacity needed to handle the presented load of microvascular filtric including plasma protein and cells that normally leak from the bloodstream into the interstitium. We classify lymphedema into congenital and secondary. Congenital is usually due to lymphatic dysplasia and secondary, it is consequence of surgical intervention, chemotherapy, radiation treatments, trauma, stasis, valvular insufficiency and are the problems. The most important thing to diagnose lymphedema and lipedema is to take a good history, listen to the patient, listen to their symptoms. Do they experience heaviness, pressure, pain, particularly in lower extremity, difficulty with mobility? On a clinical presentation, please undress the patient and visualize is the swelling unilateral, bilateral? Is there symmetry, asymmetry? What does the lymphedema look like? On physical examination, feel and touch. 
see the skin, evaluate the skin, see the stemmer sign, Godet sign. Godet sign is when you uh, visualize the edema in the subcutaneous tissue by putting simple pressure. Then before the treatment, do the measurements. And we have a variety of different types, tape, volumetric, tonometry, bioimpedance, barometry, and others. In diagnostic testing, if needed, we do imaging. Lymphocentigraphy replaced lymphangiogram, which was with some consequences. And we do lymphangiogram only in surgical intervention when it's medically necessary. MRI, SPECT CT, lymphocentigraphy, LCG, lymphocentigraphy, DEXA. And in our center, I use ultrasound to visualize the skin and subcutaneous tissue. And near infrared uh, fluoroscopy or uh, is usually assessed before surgical intervention or during the surgery to visualize the patency of the lymph collectors. Clinical presentation, the congenital is also Milroy's disease and it's present at the birth. As you can see this little, little beautiful girl, one leg is more in involved than the other. Similar, you can see all with progression the involvement of the entire lower extremity with dorsum of the foot and stem assigned positive. Interesting patient, he came to me when he was uh, 60 years old. He was misdiagnosed all his life. Actually, he was treated as lupus-like syndrome. And whenever he had episode of cellulitis, which he had at least three, four times per year, mm -hmm. In the emergency room, they just injected him with steroids. And eventually we saw him, treated him, he responded fairly well. Primer lymphedema occurs either early or before the age of 32, it's primary lymphedema precox. This young lady at the age of 14, played soccer and, and twisted her ankle and swelling progressed. Finally, the progression was visualized throughout the entire left lower extremity confirmed by lymphocentigraphy where we inject technetium 99 with visualization first 20 minutes. Uh, and this picture is two hours later where you can see already less the number of lymph nodes in the inguinal, iliac, and aortic lymph nodes, and extravasation of the tracer where the proteins leaked into the interstitial tissue, and it collates with the episode of cellulitis that she had before. Secondary lymphedema. We start with normal lymphatic system and either trauma, surgery, cancer, may interrupt the lymph pathways. This gentleman had melanoma and started melanoma in the toe, which progressed to the inguinal area and ended up in left lower extremity significant swelling. Uh, similarly, we see a lot of prostate cancer patients after adenectomy with involvement of lower extremity. And I need to point out lymphedema is unilateral or if bilateral, one leg is more involved than the other. And if you look closely at this patient, she had lymphoma, ended up with lymphedema of right low extremity more than left, but also breast cancer. So upper extremity is involved as well. On physical examination, visualize the skin, see the discoloration and make sure that the patient doesn't have any open wounds. Stem assigned positive when the second toe is slightly, it's more swollen and the tissue consistency congested. Upper extremity, secondary lymphedema. This lovely gentleman was a dentist 
and he had sarcoma in the axillary area leading to not only in involvement of the entire upper extremity, but hand and fingers. That cost him his profession. He no longer could be practicing as a dentist with a reduction of mobility in hand and fingers. This young lady had breast cancer with involvement of the radial nerve and ending up with flaccid left, right upper extremity and she's right hand dominant. So we have to encounter all of these aspects. When we see patient with upper extremity involvement, correlation of lymphocentigraphy shows us the reduction of the lymph nodes on the involved auxiliary area normal lymph nodes on the sound side. When the patient develops increased skin temperature, erythema, sometimes a redness, sometimes a little blotches that they look like mosquito bites or profound erythema, make sure the patient is being treated or referred for medical um, evaluation for antibiotic treatment immediately. This young boy was bitten by mosquito at the age of 11. Significant swelling progressed very rapidly. And when he was uh, referred to our clinic, on the clinical examination, we can see that he was leaking and he, he was leaking a clear fluid a little bit milkish fluid. At the same time, I asked the boy, what does his urine look like? And he said, normal. So I gave him a cup and he brought me a milk-like substance. He didn't know this was not normal. An MRI showed abnormality of the lymph structures in the involved site. When we did a lymphocentigraphy, and this is compliments to Dr. Glass, uh, who is a very prominent lymphocentigrapher and nuclear medicine doctor, we decided to do injection to the sound side first and only, only to the right lower extremity. And first two hours, you can see visualization of the tracer up to the inguinal and iliac lymph nodes. Three hours later, there was already spilling to the involved side. And 24 hours later, you see clear outline with extravasation of the tracer on the involved side. This is Kylo's reflux. Lymphedema, secondary lymphedema to a uterine cancer. Again, lymphocentigraphy shows clinic, clinical picture co correlating with lymphocentigraphy with extravasation of the tracer and lesser number of lymph nodes after the adenectomy surgical procedure. When we do um, further imaging, if necessary, if medically necessary, then a CT scan shows us the honeycomb appearance which is pathognomonic for lymphedema and uh, interstitial space filled with lymph stasis. It's interesting that recently we see quite a few patients with tonsil cancer, floral mouth cancer, or a cancer of tongue. And this patient, if you look at the magnetic uh, resonant imaging, shows uh, right side more involved than left with lymphedema. And there we have to do step-by-step -step, um, treatment for facial and neck uh, manual lymph drainage. SPECT CT is another test where the radioactive tracer material and detection of gamma rays are present. The tracer used inspect emit gamma radiation and it's measured directly and you can visualize the pathology on the slide. 
very interesting patient, Clipotrenone Weber syndrome, which is congenital anomaly of three things, osseous, vascular, and lymphatic. And you can see the different size of the toes and fingers with port wine stain on the skin, varicose veins, and lymphedema in both lower extremities. Another interesting case study where a 65-year-old woman uh, was treated for breast cancer in late 60s. At that time, we didn't know much better, and she underwent total radical mastectomy and massive radiation treatments. Consequently, not only she developed lymphedema, but she had frequent bouts of cellulitis because she had erosion on the skin. When she came to see me, she um, didn't feel well and had slight erythema in right um, distal upper extremity, but also complained of the neck pain. After the uh, treatment, antibiotic treatment, she responded well to the cellulitis, but continued to have upper back pain. Further evaluation of the CT scan showed osteomyelitis. Then she revealed she had numerous bouts of cellulitis and never paid attention to it. Consequently, the bacteria flowed it and developed osteomyelitis. She underwent surgical intervention and correction, but ended up with kyphosis and further lymphedema. After surgical procedure, we then treated her with manual lymph drainage protocol treatments, including bandaging and compression pump. And we used DM sleeve, which is FDA approved, um, into the sleeve of the compression pump. And she's doing fairly well. Another very interesting patient, he didn't know he had episodes of such lingering swelling in a right lower extremity before he was diagnosed with bladder cancer. So actually he was primal lymphedema and further adenectomy during the surgical intervention compounded the problem and he ended up with lymphedema, significant lymphedema involving right lower extremity. Again, he responded fairly well and two years later came back with more involvement in right lower extremity. Further study revealed that he had cancer of the right kidney. So what I want to point out is when patients are having unexplained progression and they don't respond to conservative management, stop, stop the MLD protocol treatment and further medical evaluation needs to be assessed, the problem. Another very interesting patient, 69 year old woman, underwent therapy in her residential area. She was outside of the California state and was treated by therapists for thoracic outlet syndrome and failed to respond to conservative management. On the clinical evaluation, we not only see that she had involvement of the left upper extremity throughout, including hand and fingers, but if you look closely, her left lower extremity has also swelling and a dorsum of the foot and stemocyne was positive. Further evaluation by lymphocentigraphy showed first 20 minutes, no visualization of any lymph nodes, which usually we should see some activity. Two hours later, she only had faint lymph nodes in the inguinal area. The left, right upper extremity reveals normal lymph nodes in the axilla. But if you look at the involved site, there was no visualization of any lymph nodes. However, she has extravasation of the tracer, again, correlating with the episodes of cellulitis that she had. 
further evaluation. Then we sent her for MRA. And MRA then revealed that she had compression of the left subclavian artery in near its origin. And if you look at the carotid arteries, they are very tortuous. In summary, this patient had profound primary or congenital absence of the left auxiliary and also inguinal lymph nodes in the limb structure, which gave her lymphedema. Um, the point is, early and objective diagnosis of lymphatic etiology is essentially essential and then appropriate treatment needs to be assessed. Another very interesting patient, 29-year-old woman, she was fine with sudden onset of left lower extremity swelling. In the proximal and progressively. I want to point out if there is any pathology in proximal, and especially um, in primal lymphedema patients, we don't we don't we don't need to see stem a positive. Okay, further evaluation revealed she had May Turner syndrome, which is left common iliac vein compressed by right common iliac artery. And it looks just like this, and there is diminished flow going into the involved side and involves left lower extremity. Similarly, on CT scan, we can see the visualization of the compression of vein and lymphosyntigraphy. First 20 minutes, it shows some activity in the inguinal area in the lymph nodes. This is anterior view and posterior view. Three hours later, you can see now focal visualization of extravasation of the tracer into the left dominantly medial of the thigh. Her lymph nodes were present. So the next step was to send her for vascular evaluation and intravascular ultrasound showed 50% reduction in the flow with stenting. She achieved nearly 100% opening and responded to the treatment very well. We also see patients with phlebo lymphedema, a combination. And as you can see, this patient not only has varicosity, increased swelling, stemocyne positive, but she also has stagnation of vascular origin. So it's phlebo lymphedema. Similar treatment to phlebo lymphedema, just like in lipedema, lymphedema, then we manual lymph drainage and compression is essential for these patients. And now let's switch to lipedema. Lipedema is a lymphatic microvascular disease with pathological accumulation of subcutaneous adipose tissue leading to bilateral symmetrical disproportional volume increase in lower extremities. In some cases, and now with ultrasound studies, I see that there is majority of lipidema patients with involvement of arms as well. What is interesting that just recently it was published that the biomarker BF4 is also elevated in lipidema patients, which uh, this marker is usually elevated in lymphatic structures with inflammatory changes. And Dr. Karen Herbst gave a fabulous presentation on lipedema, pointing out it is a disease also of loose connective tissue. Here is presentation, clinical presentation. And I think my slide went down a little bit. Stage one, 
this young lady was a ballet dancer. And finally, she was asked to stop because her legs were progressing in a symmetrical fashion and in volume. Stage two with progression, and you can feel from the rice type of texture in subcutaneous tissue, uh, slight nodularity with progression in stage three and significant lobes in further stage four. Stage four then leads to lipolymphedema with aneurysm in usually in the ankle region due to significant volume pressing on small structures. Compliments of Dr. Jamie Schwartz, and I want you to visualize, this is what lipidema looks like on surgery. The patient had predominant swelling in, in her anterior knee. And Remember how she said this whole area? You can see this. Essentially what it is. And another one. And this is subcutaneous fascia. Everything is on superior to subcutaneous fascia, distal to the skin. And fibrous bands are in between the lobules of the fat. Okay, back to lipidema. So fibrosis, fibrosis in loose connective tissue is present. Extracellular water is higher. Water is higher in fat tissue as presented already with Dr. Herbst and her team. VEGF factor levels are higher. VEGF factor induces formation of leaks. And there is macrophages in subcutaneous space. And they are higher in fat and skin. On clinical examination, I also look at the eyelid. And in lipidema patient, you can open it widely. And I work with ophthalmologists who sends me patients when they see excessive, um, al supposedly allergic reaction in the eyelid, which correlates with lipidema. Normally, you cannot open the eyelid so wide. Hypermobility is present, as indicated, not only in the fingers, but uh, in elbows and in hyperextension of the knees. And uh, let me show you this. Mobility, hypermobility of the skin on the top of the skull. This is not, this is typical for lipidema. Okay. Okay. On physical examination, look at the skin and look at vascular fragility and I knew this patient for quite some time and after years she developed increased vascularization into this massive area on both knees, left more than right. And if uh, one would do surgical intervention, similarly, as you see on the video, the, the massive subcutaneous tissue is present. Pre present. Most of the lipidema patients, if you look at them, they are in genu valgum. And we see also pronation of the ankles. And this was published by Solnoki and his team in Hungary, which he shows that complex decongestive physiotherapy decreases capillary fragility in lipidema patients. Here is a nice presentation of lipidema patient with lymphocentigraphy. 
And lymphocentigraphy shows normal and fairly symmetrical presence of the inguinal iliac and aortic lymph nodes. However, she also had episodes of cellulitis and you have increased rate of flow on the left lower extremity, correlating with fluorescent angiography. When do we develop lipedema? Usually it starts at the age of, with the onset of menses. And I am presenting you this young girl from the age of 11 to 12, she gained 80 pounds. She didn't change much of her dietary uh, component. However, she just progressed. Lymphocentigraphy again shows some popliteal lymph nodes, which uh, popliteal lymph nodes are, not, are pathological. And it points out that the superficial lymphatic system dives into deep lymphatic system, but lymph nodes are present in the inguinal iliac and aortic structure in fairly symmetrical fashion. Her mom accompanied her and she had very recent gastric bypass by losing 50 pounds. So if you correlate these two, there is a great similarity in expressing medial aspect of both knees on mother and daughter. And unfortunately, daughter already has cuffing at the ankles. But if you look at the mother, it's almost getting there. So yes, it is. there is a strong genetic component. When we do ultrasound, I am concerned about the skin and subcutaneous space and visualization of the strong connecti connective tissue subcutaneous fascia as clearly depicted on this beautiful diagram. And this patient with lymphedema, lymphedema secondary to uterine cancer and treatments and adenectomy and radiation treatments in her medial distal thigh, you can see skin and enlargement of subcutaneous space. And here is subcutaneous fascia. When we progress down to the medial calf, the skin gets much thicker with some lobularities and the dark represents a fluid component that is being trapped there. And predominantly we see it in ankle region with all these fatty lobules, fluid component, and the skin is not very well demarcated. Typical for lymphedema. In comparison, lymphedema to the other side, uninvolved side, here we cannot really see delineation of the skin, but subcutaneous space is enlarged. And on, on the uninvolved side, normal skin and subcutaneous space. And this is gastronomous muscle. This was published where we compared lymphedema and lipedema and control. And again, in lymphedema, you see thicker skin and increased subcutaneous space with hypoechogenicity. In lipedema, you have very thin skin with little lacoons, little gapping from overstretching and hypoechogenicity with much increased subcutaneous space. And here are just a little remnants of subcutaneous fascia, barely visible. In comparison to normal control, normal skin and very small space, subcutaneous space. And um, this was published last year. Again, in lipedema, you can see the thinner skin. And here is subcutaneous space with hypoechogenicity and subcutaneous fascia. 
and frequently when I do the ultrasound, I see bifurcation of the subcutaneous fascia. And as I pointed once before, I call it dancing fascia. Okay, now in medial calf, again, this is gastronomius, skin is thin, subcutaneous space is larger than if we would compare to control. And on medial ankle, similarity of, of the skin and increased subcutaneous space with small visualization of small subcutaneous, maybe subcutaneous fascia interrupted. Interesting study we did just recently where we compared light and deep manual lymph drainage and combined that with intermittent pneumatic compression pump. And this was on lipedema patient, thin skin starting before MLD. We did ultrasound before MLD and measured the subcutaneous space and subcutaneous fascia. 30 minutes later after MLD administered to both lower extremities by two therapists, you can visualize the skin and subcutaneous space is smaller and subcutaneous fascia is more visible. And with deep MLD, we achieved 29.7% reduction. But when we combine this with MLD and compression pump, we achieved 38%. And yes, it was by lymphopress. Okay, so skin, and you can see the dancing fascia here, and subcutaneous space is significantly smaller. So combination, yes, I do recommend combination of MLD with compression pump as efficacious uh, approach to treatment, not only to lymphedema, but also to lipedema, as well as to phlebolymphedema. Okay, so from conservative point of view, we do MLD and deep tissue therapy. And Dr. Herbst pointed out in her study on lipedema patient, she had some uh, improvement on deep versus light MLD on lipedema patients with com combination of pneumatic compression pump, we have much better efficacy. Um, a low, laser a low level laser is also used for lipedema patient vibration plate. Uh, Dr. Uh, Karen Herbst had a wonderful study with efficacy of the vibration plate on lipedema patients. And what do we recommend for the home to co continue with exercise program, swimming or aquatic exercises is the best if possible, if not walking and definitely compression garments to apply right after MLD treatments. Important aspect of uh, lipidema is nutrition and um, the nut nutrition guide for lymphedema and lipidema was published by Dr. Karen Herbst, Chuck um, and others, including moi. In, in surgical approach for lipidema, and now we have several techniques, different lymph sparing liposuction is uh, showing a reduction, not only in the pain, but mainly improvement in mobility. And we are happy to see that now the insurances are uh, having positive uh, aspect in terms of reimbursement. So how do we do the treatment? Conservative treat tre treatment, we do manual lymph drainage, then we apply the DM sleeve. This is for the hygienic uh, purpose. We apply the DM sleeve before we administer the sleeve of the pump for lipidema patients. If the abdominal area is also involved, this is fantastic uh, toy for the reduction of the volume and upper extremity lymphedema patient as well. 
what is the efficacy? Well, IPC regarding hemodynamic effects is largely documented. IPC, intermittent pneumatic compression, increases venous flow velocity in the superficial and also deep vein of the limb when measured by echo or platysmography, increases arterial venous pressure gradient, prevent DVT, deep venous thrombosis, by improving peripheral circulation. And also there are studies that intermittent pneumatic compression on a calf reduces uh, formation of the cellulitis. The use of IPC in congestive heart failure patients significantly increases the right auricular pressure, mean pul pulmonary artery pressure, and decreases systemic vascular resistance in most patients without clinical worsening as it was documented on, on this study. Uh, one has to be careful when you use pump on patients with congestive with active congestive heart failure, renal failure, or I would not use pump on pregnant women in first trimester. And with that, I want thank you for your... Uh, for being on the edge of our seats. Yes, that was wonderful. And if you have any questions, I think we have some time left for questions. We absolutely yes. do. We want to get to them. Thank you so much, Dr. Eicher. And thank you, everybody. You've taken time out of your busy day to be here. We do want to apologize. We acknowledge that the screen was a little bit smaller than you would have liked. We had some technical difficulties heading into today, but we felt it was more important to just keep going and stay on time because we know you have limited time wherever you are in your respective locations. I don't know about you, but I the whole time was going, oh, when I was seeing these photos. And especially, Dr. Eicher, when you told the story of the 11 year old girl who gained 80 pounds without changing her diet at all. You know, I know your heart is personally connected to a lot of these patients. And you also have a personal lymphedema story, don't you? I developed lymphedema. Well, it's known. I had lymphoma when I was 21 in the right inguinal area and um, after surgery. And at that time it was cobalt treatment. Uh, it was massive radiation. And a year and a half later, it progressed to the left side. So I had additional surgery, chemo and radiation. Uh, today I am saying I'm blessed to be alive, but instead of being surgeon as I opted to be initially, my life was changed with my onset of lymphedema. So I branched to rehab, physical medicine and rehabilitation. And in early eighties, there was not that much about lymphedema at all. And I explored all the modalities on myself first. And before I would recommend or send a recommendation, I usually test every gadget on my leg first before I will give my approval. So I, I say it's, it's um, a luxury that I live with lymphedema. So I know what the patients are going through and what they are um, experiencing. But at the same time, life is so precious. So with early diagnosis and early treatment, uh, we can have fairly, fairly good life. Wonder, that was beautifully said and a great entree to all the questions. If you wouldn't mind, Dr. Eicher, you can stop sharing your screen. That way everybody can see your face as you answer some of these questions. Well, maybe Fun. To keep it screen on. <laughs> Yay. And we have our friend Eric Ansart there as well. We do have a question about the Optimal Plus that I want to raise to you, Eric, in a minute. But let's get to this Cassandra Doughton question. How long does intermittent pneumatic compression actually help? Is it use it or lose it? If you use it an hour every day, but then you stop, do the benefits just continue? And, you know, I, the way I understand it is that you must be compliant and it must be part of your regimen in order for you to sustain the benefits. But please 
refute me or shed light on that, Dr. Eicher? Uh, I always tell patients that I can administer and I can help, but the other 50% is up to the patient's compliance. And if the patient is not adhering to the diet and exercises and compression and self-care, then we are not going to get any benefits from the treatment. So we have to work together. And um, the pumps are fabulous when it's medically necessary. And one, the patient, if the patient is compliant and a pump is used once a day for half an hour to one hour, that should be sufficient. There was a study, well, way back when, um, a study was done on lymphedema patients where the patients were hospitalized. And those were the days where even low back patients were hospitalized in early 80s. And the study showed that the patients were on, on the pump for, I believe, seven days nonstop, except for going to the bathroom. And so, and there was a significant improvement. However, once the patient got out of the bed after the seven days without compression, it filled in and the lymphedema returned back to pre-existing. Pre so my, my point is use the pump at home and before using pump, uh, do the manual lymph drainage, uh, use the pump for half an hour, one hour, and keep your leg slightly elevated if it's your leg that is being involved. And then apply compression stockings after, if it's done in the morning. At night, you can use any of those uh, compression gadgets if you can tolerate them, or just go for a good night rest and go about the day. In my personal life, uh, you know, I have wonderful 12 year old twins. According to the time frame, I massage my leg in the morning, sometimes five minutes, sometimes 10 minutes. And then I put my compression stocking on and I go about my day. At the end of the day, um, I take my stocking off, I take a shower, I massage. And again, if I have more time, I massage more and I use the pump. If I, with all honesty, if I have time, I use the pump. If not, I use it next day. And compliance is essential. And that applies also for the nutritional aspect. Okay. That's another point that we get a lot of questions about as well. And one point I'd like to make about compliance your device must be easy to use for people to be compliant with it. And that's one of the things we hear over and over again about Lymphopress. It is easy to use. Harvey Mayervitz asks, does the pump pressure influence the lipid directly? Uh, hello, doctor. <laughs> um, we need to do more research. Uh, and I would love to have you here in California because we have a lot of patients. I know you are in Florida, I believe. Uh, does it influence lipid? If it's fluid in, in, involved, yes, it may. But in more advanced cases, as you saw on the slide, uh, that lipid is very hard. And so nothing will help except surgical intervention when you have the very advanced cases. And as you know, lipidema patients do not respond to dietary changes. And if they do, it's very minimal. So uh, my point is uh, early diagnosis, early, early treatment, and changing the lifestyle with reduction of uh, with the dietary absolute dietary restriction of sugar and uh, dairy products and gluten. It's essential for lipidema patient combining with exercise programs such as swimming and compression garments and compression pump. 
we hear often it's not one size fits all in terms of diet. For instance, there are many women that have, and, and I say women for lipedema because it's primarily a condition that impacts women, but for lymphedema and lipedema, some people have great success with keto, some people with an anti-inflammatory diet. What I've heard people say is what works for you may not work for the next person. So do you actually recommend a nutritional plan or a diet beyond what you just said, avoiding sugar, avoiding dairy? Um, during the consult, uh, consultation, I spend a lot of time with patients explaining them the diagnosis we do the ultrasound because sometimes uh, you may see a surprise as I saw not that long ago, I saw a lovely lady and looked like lipedema, but she had Durkum's nodules everywhere, which is completely different entity. And so I spend time not only on a clinical aspect, but also guiding them with nutrition. Regarding keto diet, some patients respond well to keto diet. And what I advise them is, if it works for you, uh, try, but I don't recommend staying on keto diet too long. I had patients who developed kidney problems. Mm. So one has to be careful what kind of pre-existing condition patient may have and um, any drastic dietary changes may then impact the pre-existing condition. So with the keto diet, if it works for a short period of time, stay on it and then switch to something, a paleo diet or uh, something that will be uh, not as uh, harsh as, as keto diet. Gotcha. So a follow-up question is about nutritional supplements. Are there any recommendations specifically for lymphedema and lipedema? This is asked by Lita Messinger. Thank you, Lita, for asking the question. Nutritional supplements. Nutritional supplement will stay well on, on a protein diet and uh, combine it with vegetables. Stay away from the gluten and stay away from sugars and if you desire to drink milk, we are lucky to live in this beautiful country that we have so many varieties of different milks um, other than um, from the cow. Uh, goat milk is fairly good. Goat yogurt is very good. So you can, you can try that. And according to your body frame, stay with the calorie restriction so you don't go to 3,000 or 4,000 calorie per day um, according to your body mass index, stay within the frame and combine it with exercises. In terms of supplements, uh, for lipedema, wonderful supplement is Vital Zyme. I should not, I don't know whether I should mention that, just email me and I'll tell you all about supplements because I don't want to advertise something that I may um, trespass the boundaries. Understood, and thank you. Um, lymphocytography, is it necessary to get a diagnosis? Keenan Joseph Ghani wants to ask that. Thank you for the question, Keenan. Uh, you know, necessary, no, it's not necessary, but it guides us. It, it, look, I have been practicing since um, early 90s, and uh, even though I have enough experience, I sometimes I need to confirm the clinical presentation, which may be questionable. And so it may not look like lipedema, maybe one leg a little bit more uh, swollen than the other, and it feels like lipedema. When in doubt, I send patients for lymphocytography. And definitely patients prior surgery must have lymphocytography. Excellent. And in lipedema patients, um, my previous uh, talk was out of 16 patients, which was amazing, we found out 50% of lipedema patients had some abnormality on lymphocytography, which may be helpful to guide the therapist to use alternative pathways, which uh, if the, the pre standard pathways are not uh, utilized. 
you had mentioned the Stemmers sign, and I had heard of that before, but there was another test you mentioned, and both Cassandra Downton and I want to know, what was that other? Godet. Godet. Godet sign, you press on the skin, and if you, if you see an indentation, if you want, I'll go back to the slide, but then I will lose your pretty face. We might lose you, and we're running out of time, so I'd rather you just... Oh, it, uh, pressing, pressing on the skin to visualize uh, the subcutaneous tissue. And if there is indentation, you know, uh, there is some fluid component there. Got it. A lot of questions, rightfully so, surrounding insurance coverage. I don't know if this is in your wheelhouse, Dr. Eicher, but for instance, Mahalia Smith says, most of my lipedema patients do not get coverage for MLD, intermittent pneumatic compression, or liposuction. Any advice on getting past that hurdle? There was also yes, another question MLD, about that. Yes, I'm sorry, MLD should be reimbursed. Lipedema, MLD, use different codes. If you have Good. a question, email me. MLD should be, if you are a licensed therapist or occupational therapist, you have the right to use the codes and uh, send it to insurance. I don't know about massage therapists, perhaps not, but um, now, in terms of liposuction, some insurances started to pay. And during the consultation, I always put down the trial of conservative management for X amount of time. If patient fails to respond to conservative management, we recommend this and that, and that surgical intervention, which will improve mobility and reduce the pain and attach the article with that. Very good. So we had a question specifically about pressure and intermittent pneumatic compression. Someone was concerned first about tolerability because with lipedema, there is often pain associated with it. Is there a pressure that is recommended? And if pneumatic compression creates too much pressure? Wonderful question, wonderful yes. question. In, I showed you on a picture in my practice, I developed the DM sleeve um, and interesting, very quickly interesting uh, uh, aspect. I was in Tokyo at the first symposium and finally I was alone in the hotel room and I was looking at my lymphedema leg and I thought there must be something, how I can reduce that and quickly and so on. So I came up with this and it's DM sleeve and has a specific meaning to me and, and it works. So we use the DM sleeve, which helps to redistribute the flow into the sleeve of the pump. And with that, we don't have any consequences. Uh, we don't have any uh, poor tolerance. When someone is frail and 80 year old and so on, I use pressure from 40 to 45, maybe. When someone is 30 years old and stage two lipedema, I may go up to 60, but I, I yet did not have comp, uh, any patient complaining that it was too much pressure. Very good point. I appreciate that so much. And one of the things that Dr. Herbst has said is that the lympho press is uniquely suited to deal with that fibrotic tissue because of the pressures that are available. And with combination of that DM sleeve, the black sleeve that we put into the sleeve of the pump, immediately we see softer tissue consistency after treatment. Yeah, that's so gratifying. So Eric, I'm so glad you were with us to answer this question. We'll give Dr. Eicher a moment's break. There was a question about the Optimal Plus and this woman has done her research, lipolymphedema she has, stage three or four. She's researching the lympha pants, which are unique because they come up, they cover the entire abdomen all the way down to the bottom of your feet. And then she's contrasting it with another very unique garment, which is the lympha pod. Now we have expanders for different sizes needed for the lympha pants. And I remember calling you recently and saying, should we do a pod or should we do pants? And you had a really good answer that I'd love for you to share. Yeah, I absolutely be happy to do that. I wanted to hop on here. First off, Dr. Ecker, to thank you for your time and incredible presentation. We have 
I, we can't even read through the amount of people who are saying thank you and, and appreciative of your presentation. So thank you for that. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. And it's something that does come up from time to time. I will tell you the, I think what I would focus on is the fact that if you are putting an expander in to a, a garment, as you get reduction, you'll have the option to take it out. So we do have the lymphopod device that is made for more of our bariatric patients, patients who are in excess of 450, 500, 600 pounds. And it's a tremendous product for that patient. But if you're able to fit into one of our pants garments, even if it means you add a zipper expander in there, you always have the option to remove that zipper expander as you start to see reduction. So my suggestion would be to default to the pants garment with the zippered in expander and then just remove that expander if you start to see reduction and you can. Fantastic. Thank you. Let me just quickly point in. When I have lipedema patients with more involvement in proximal lateral thigh region, there is no way how you can uh, improve uh, with just ordinary leg sleeve. So I put them into this garment all the way up to the chest wall and they res the response is enormous. That's, that's great. So um, Eric, I'm gonna defer to you because we still have a few more questions here, but I don't know if we have a hard stop, so I will yield to you. Yeah, so let me, let me do this. So we have quite a few questions and I know a few of you have asked for Dr. Eicher's email address and billing codes for lipedema and we appreciate all that. What I would suggest is if you email the point of contact for this meeting, which will be me, I'll be able to forward those in one, one email to Dr. Eicher so she's not going through and answering you know, a dozen different responses. And uh, we'd be happy to be able to provide that feedback. We respect Dr. Eicher's time. I know all of you do. She's got a busy schedule. And for her out on the West Coast, she's still in the middle of her workday. So I don't want to extend this beyond the, our hard cutoff. But do want to thank you very much for your time today and the incredible presentation again. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all thank very you. much. Thank you. Yes. Bye. Thanks for being here. We'll continue to bring you great content with thought leaders, people that are making a difference in the world of lymphedema and lipedema, like the amazing Dr. Eicher. We appreciate you. You will get an email after this with links and other information, and we love staying connected with you. We want to know how we can serve you better, and we are so happy to help you and your patients. So have a Bye. wonderful day, everybody. Bye, wonderful everybody. Team, wonderful. Thank you so much. And Send me all the questions. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.